Before we get into the episode, future Tyler and Jay here would like to just come with a quick announcement about our audio. So we are aware of it in that my wife has told me there's a problem. I happen to be tone deaf and edit the podcast. If audio issues do bother you, please skip ahead to episode eight where we get a new setup. Yes. New microphones, new setup, new everything. Audio is much better. and I think it'll be a much more enjoyable listen. So please bear with us. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Episode three or halfway through the pilot episode. We're yeah, here. We, we made it halfway <laughs> through episode one. And anyone that has listened to the first few episodes and came back, thank you. Thank you, honestly. We're trying our best to be as complete as possible. And yep. this is going to be a journey. It's going to be an entire thing. This is going to consume probably the next several years of our life. Yeah, we're going to be old before this is over. So we should probably get straight into this. So let's get started. Before we get into the actual episode and the references, the last episode we did of the podcast I realized that you didn't know that the ca- actors are not all the actors that were in the original unaired pilot. I didn't even know there was an unaired pilot, if I'm being honest. I'm. Well, so we needed to fix that. I mean, we said we're going to be completists. We need to be. How complete. am I? You're going to have to take over for that because how am I supposed to know there's a secret, super locked up. In the vault pilot that no one has ever seen. There's so many things in my little caverns of my brain that I did not realize needed to be shared. So, for anybody else who doesn't know, the two characters we are talking about is Suki and Dean. Now, both of these had different actors in the unaired original pilot. And I made you go back and watch the clips of those scenes to see what you thought. Do you have thoughts? I mean, thank God they changed them. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, that's just... Neither were a good fit from a, a chemistry standpoint with the other actors. They were not a good fit in that role to have the counterplay and the banter back and forth. Mm. I, I don't think you could replace Melissa McCarthy. Yes. So let, we'll start with Suki then. So Suki obviously is played by Melissa McCarthy. Obviously. Um, but originally in the unaired pilot was played by Alex Bornstein, who you would know in the pilot as Drella. Yes, which completely valid character in their own right and a delightful, more snarky, more sarcastic version. Which I enjoy which it, thoroughly. Just to, that's not who Suki is no. later on in the show. So it's it, it's not a good fit for her casting wise. But she's a phenomenal actress. Now, I, being the elder millennial that I am, know her as the girl from Mad TV. Yes. Um, But you said she was in other things, too. Uh, Yes. She's most famous for her voice work in Family Guy for Lois Griffin. That makes sense. I knew it definitely wasn't Meg, because if you know, you know. It's Mila Kunis. It's (laughs) it's not the same. Yes. And the rest of them are basically Seth MacFarlane. Yes, and for anybody who is a super Gilmore Girls fan, which I'm hoping is everybody, um, she is also later in this series as Miss Celine. She is. She also has a different couple other credits oh. on the official IMDb. Uh, the other one is Doris's voice. Doris's vo- Oh, Doris. So Doris is, if I remember correctly, and I'm sure there are going to be super fans that correct me, but I believe Doris is the neighbor who... Goes out of town and Lorelai has to water his garden. It's the ex-wife. It is the voice recording on the answer machine. the voicemail. Amazing. Next time I listen to that, I'm going to have to listen for her voice. Because that is an amazing, iconic voicemail. And also terrifying. So It is. Also, there are unconfirmed reports that she also was the the voice of the tour guide in the the house that Luke bought. Oh, okay. The, The, The museum. The Twickham house. Twickham, yeah. All right. So she's apparently also there, but I couldn't find an official credit 
So we're going to be listening to that with a fine tooth comb when we yep. get there. Great. So much to look forward to. But she, she has more uh, credits for this show than any other person because she's in it like five times. I think that's awesome. I also love the fact that Amy Sherman Palladino always brings back actors. So you're going to notice a lot that people keep re-popping up, which is amazing. Um, but yes, I will just say I agree with you that I don't think the chemistry really worked. And I thought she was pretty... Um, she was a little bit too... I don't want to say dry, but like monotone, where Melissa McCarthy is very like, kind of like airy and warm and, and peppy personable, and, and just it's it's a different dynamic. It was it was very wooden. Yes, to me. which if I were to say who I'd rather hang out with, it's Drella, of course. But <laughs> um, and then Dean. So Dean's actually for me was a newer thing that I've learned. I didn't know that Jared Padalecki was not originally Dean. Um, and this other actor, which of course I should have had the name off the top of my head, but I don't, not somebody I knew, um, for, in, in anything else. Um, and I just, one, didn't find him as alluring as Dean. And I also just, yeah. I just, I didn't like their connection. I didn't feel any chemistry there. Well, so two things working against the original fake Dean, <laughs> uh, he doesn't have the same towering stature that Jerry Padalecki does in because he's like looms over yes Alexis Bledel which is wonderful for uh, a lot of reasons it's the he also has that brooding bad boy teen vibe better better down like he and has, has that, the hair I mean that is the 90s hair well, it's just it's it was a, a way different dynamic and, and in the pilot when I watched that scene where they're interacting it was just not even it was not it was not the same no, it's, it's once you have Jared, you need him. Like, that is that is what it is. So, okay, now that we've gotten through that, we do need to get into it. Uh, I like to give a little bit of a summary of where we are in the episode since we are kind of doing this weird, like... Yeah, 15 minutes in? Yeah, yeah. So, this is from 18 minutes and 10 seconds to 30 minutes and 3 seconds. And the summary is where we left off. Lorelai had just realized that she's going to have to go to ask her parents for money. Uh, Lorelai does in this sequence ask Richard and Emily for money and Emily agrees but only under two conditions one they have to have Friday night dinners and two they have to uh call once a week to update on their life and then at us presumably around the same time Rory meets Dean and starts having second thoughts about going to Chilton right and does relay that information to Lorelai Lorelai starts questioning and we end off this sequence with Lorelai being like we know she knows she knows what's going on she she's 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 now in the loop rory was not completely forthcoming with the reasoning as to why in the typical teenage fashion just i don't want to can we just stop talking about it yeah, yeah. and lorelei's like mm, and then it clicks let's start with the first reference which was the song that's where the colors don't go by sam phillips so Sam Phillips is all over the show. Like I did all didn't, over the show, and I did she, not know this either before we looked this up. So she does the la 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 la, iconic it's, la it, la's for the song it, it's, for the, the show. The entire show has these in the background throughout the entire run. Yeah. It's just la la la. It's la 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 la. la. Yeah, it's yeah. everywhere. Yeah. yeah, Sam Phillips is the composer of Gilmore Girls, which I did not know. Yeah, and when she was approached by Amy Sherman Palladino. Uh, she was told that she wanted to do a different take on it where the soundtrack was almost like a, a good friend or an actual active member of the, the cast oh, as terrible. a character. So she wanted, she wanted the soundtrack to be almost a character. It is. And it's, it is. You can't hear the La La's and not know what show we're talking about. Like, and, and you don't even necessarily have to be a super fan. You just, you just know. Like, that is just what it is. Yeah, and she has a, a wonderful heartwarming story where she accidentally called the police to her house uh in, early in the morning one morning she was tired she typed in the wrong code for i'm being held hostage in my own house oh no <laughs> and so two police officers show up and they're like no 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 and they saw the st sound recording studio and they're like, oh what do you do and she explained it and i'm like oh again what girls i love that show it's tuesdays at eight <laughs> that's adorable like love that for her and yes, it was Tuesdays at 8 back then. Uh, on the WB. Yes, it was. I used to tell everybody, nobody can bother me on Tuesdays at 8 o'clock because that is what's going to be on TV. I remember that fondly. This song was Where the Colors Don't Go. This was recomposed for Gilmore Girls, but it was on Sam Phillips' original album from 1991 called Cruel Inventions. It's a very odd... It, it, it definitely fits, but it's, it's a very eclectic kind of 
vibe and sound. And kind of morose, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a downer. If I'm going to be honest, it's, it's a little bit of a mood killer. Yeah, so this plays as Lorelai is thinking about going to talk to her parents. So I believe yep. the, they're zooming in on the portrait of her as a child with her parents. And it's really kind of, in my mind, they're kind of showing her going back to her parents' house and how she feels like that is where basically her dreams go to die. I mean, the, Yeah, she'd the, rather pull a bank job. She would she, literally yes. rather rob a bank. Yeah, the quote from this song that I think mostly encapsulates what's going on is where the dreams stop and fears keep. Yep. So she's really, she feels like, you know, doing this is like upending everything that she's built. And then it also has a, a reference to uh, when white, uh, one white flag, which I'm assuming means that she's like surrendering to her mother's wishes because... Yeah, she's going to cave. Emily Gilmore... Always gets what she wants. I mean, that's just, that's the underlining tone of the show is that Emily Gilmore will not be denied. <laughs> uh, it just, it may not be the best way to go about something, but she will, at the end of the day, get what she wants, even if she has to crush people to do it. Yeah, I mean, that is fair. And it, it we haven't met the parents just no. yet. So this really kind of sets up how the audience is going to feel about the parents because I mean this song is dark like, and if you haven't listened to it it's the lyrics are very short like the, it's, yeah, it's not, not a long, a long song. song you could definitely go do that but it's it's dark like for it's, this show it's very dark it's a very somber kind of depre not depressing but it's it's a it's a down on the dumps kind of song yeah it talks about cobwebs like yeah. they're not <laughs> not a happy thing so anyway. Uh, the next reference we have is Barron's. No, you actually pointed this out. This isn't on any other reference list that I can find. I don't necessarily know that it's a reference, but it certainly is a a typecasting or a setting the scene for who Richard is as a person and a character. You already understand that he's very well off uh, because of the house. It's a it's not a house; it's a mansion, and he, he's reading Barron's because that's what you would expect someone to be doing in that house you'd be reading barons wall street journal forbes all of the the financial periodicals and in, in newspapers uh i mean new york times and barons are basically sister publications and it's just it's 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 what rich people read yes so for scene setting at this point lorelei has walked into her house she is meeting with her mom and her dad and he is sitting there reading barons and I think at this point in the show, we don't actually know what Richard and Emily do. We don't know anything about them. We just know they have money. And showing him reading Barons is basically a, a clue to the audience. Like, he's got money. Like, you don't yeah. read Barons if you're just, like, you know, a blue-collar No worker. one reads like, it for fun because it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's about the market. It's about he's, he's in insurance and it's tied to investments and, and high finance on, on Wall Street. It's, I mean, it's the periodical to read, basically, or it was, it's the standard. Yeah, and I mean, so we don't know he's an insurance yet, but we do find that out later on. Uh, just a fun fact that it was founded in 1921. It was a sister publication to Wall Street Journal, and it covers U.S. financial info, market developments, and relevant statistics. The founder of Barron's actually had a very good reputation, and that's the type of very well-to-do affluent person that we should want in society because he was very, he, he set the standard for financial journalism mm. and uh, he held people to account. He actually investigated Charles Ponzi. Yeah, well, we all know what Ponzi scheme was, I think. Inventor of the Ponzi scheme. So he's instrumental in having him arrested. So very much a by the book, you can't do anything improper and how we have fallen. <laughs> Now, do you think that um, there's a reason why Richard would choose this journal versus the Wall Street Journal? Because they're all, they both are financial periodicals in, in their own right. See, I think it's because Wall, the, well, Barron's is a once a week publisher. Mm -hmm. And so it's Friday night. So it comes oh, out okay. on Friday. So and maybe he, reference he, he to Friday. He reads the journal every day, obviously. And then he reads Barron's when it comes out. Gotcha. Okay, so it could be a, a foreshadowing reference to the fact that we're going to be seeing them every Friday. Yeah. That could be. Interesting and fun. I like that. The next thing here is Bridge Club. Now, I'm just going to say, first of all, we have 
thought a lot about trying to learn to play bridge. You watched an entire video. I know how to play bridge now. I understand. Because of a video. Because of the video. <laughs> I, I learned how to play bridge for the podcast. That's how much dedication I have to making my wife happy. <laughs> For context setting, Emily mentions that she has been to Bridge Club when her and Lorelai are talking. So this is something that Emily does. Now, I've only ever known Bridge as the old people game. Like yeah, that's my, my grandparents <laughs> played Bridge. I my, my grandma had a Bridge Club. My, my grandparents on my dad's side had a Bridge Club. It's just that's what that's what people of a certain age played. But it's it's a thing. Like I, when I looked into the looked into it for this podcast. It, it's like a professional card game sport. Don't don't ask me to score it for no. the love of God. I can I, I have the basics of probably could get by with playing one of the versions. I presume yeah. you didn't learn no, all didn't. of them because no. if you didn't know, there's a lot of versions. Like this isn't a like a card game you learn and you know. No, you learn it and then other variants are around. So if somebody asks you to play bridge, you need to clarify. Like, are we talking about duplicate? Are we talking about? I don't even know all of them. Contract but bridge. Contract, yeah. Like, yeah. what are we talking here? But it is an intense game. I also think that it was another holdover to like the well-to-do society because yes. it has its ties to the the social elite in Boston, in New England, etc. That it's it's kind of a who's who. You play bridge with very specific people to make connections and further your own interests. Yes. I also think it's speaking to Emily's character. So as you mentioned, she is going to do whatever it takes to get what she wants. And she doesn't care who she crushes along the way. I think that's how you worded it. Yes. Um, Bridge is very much a game like this. It's a strategy game where you're trying to outwit your opponent. You're trying to break them down and trying to force them into playing your hand versus you playing their hand. It's very much about imposing your will on your opponent and it, it very much suits emily gilmore as a person because that's that's who she is that's what she does is she says we're doing it my way there is no conversation about it there's no discussion this is what's happening and it suits very much what she does in this scene because nope. she very much says look we will give you money which you can tell wasn't even a question for the dad the dad was he was being snarky about you need money but he was absolutely going to give it to her with no strings attached. And the mom was like, uh, no, 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 no. We're going to give you money, but you are going to be in my life because this is the leverage I have over you now. You need yeah. me, and I know you won't walk out that door without money for your daughter. So yeah. We're playing the cards that I was dealt, not the cards that you were dealt. Right. We're, I have the upper hand. She was mm. waiting for this moment. Yeah. Like, this was... And I, I mean, how do you feel about that scene? Because I... I struggle with this because I can understand from a mother perspective, you want to see your daughter and you want your granddaughter in your life. And it's made clear here that they only see each other on holidays. To be fair, I, when I initially saw this, I had no frame of reference because I'd never seen the show previously. Uh, because Gilmore Girls, for, for all its benefits and flaws, mostly benefits, is a very serial type where you have to be invested from the very yeah. beginning. And if you miss that, you're lost. Sure. And so I didn't really watch it because I didn't catch it when it started mm. on television. Uh, I had no idea what the dynamic there was. I didn't know why they were distant. I didn't know whose fault it was and what was going on. So I can understand her wanting to use leverage. I didn't realize that she was equally, if not more so, the driving factor for the, the distance. Mm. So you think that makes a difference? Knowing that yeah. Emily caused some of this difference, distance makes a difference in how you feel about the scene. I think it changes it looking back on it from when I watched it originally, where it's kind of like, I mean, they're just, it's a, a kind of distant New England grandparents. Like that, we have those. I mean, yeah, everybody had those. I mean, I know for me growing up, not that I, money, but we had no, we wish. had we had the that kind of standoffish relationship at times. Yeah, I mean, one of my one side of my grandparents lived half an hour away, which as a kid seemed like it was on the moon. Well, it's because they live in Rhode Island, yeah. and anything over ten minutes, we've already covered that. It people do not funerals, weddings. It doesn't matter if it's not ten minutes. 
Yeah, we saw them on the holidays, just like in this. It was like, you know, they were on the moon. We can't go there all the time. So I didn't, I don't know that when I first watched it, I thought much of it. But now, looking back, knowing the context, I'm like, oof, definitely using that leverage, are you? The next thing here is kind of like a a loose reference, but also like a conglomeration of all references in one scene. Yes, it's the hayride. Yes, so... As we've mentioned earlier, uh, Lane is going to go on a hayride with a Korean doctor. Korean future doctor. He's a child. <laughs> they don't jo- they don't joke about Korean oh, future doctors. I think is the line. Yes, that is true. And uh, Lorelai and Rory are walking by, seeing this happen, and yep. this is the scene that we're on. So you get to see what the hayride is first of all. Just very awkward. You see Lane sitting on the back of the the wagon in the hay with the Korean doctor. And I think people are being chap- she, she's being chaperoned, and it's just it's <laughs> it's very weird. It's, it's very an strange. awkward, <laughs> awkward situation. I think this is another set piece to show that it's in New England, even though it's filmed in Canada. Okay, but let's okay. We're from New England. We've set this up. Yeah. Um, let's just talk about that. When have you ever gone on a hayride with a Clydesdale in New England? Please tell me. I've been on a horse hayride before okay. i don't necessarily know that it was a clydesdale i don't know if i was necessarily paying attention to the type of horse that was pulling the cart so well we'll give you two contexts first of all the general hayride in new england Tractor. and you guys can correct me if i'm wrong if there, you know other parts of new england do it differently but from everything i've seen from vermont to here has been tractors Yes, now, the there, tractor there's just... exceptions, but that's the most common. I actually yep. have photos of myself on a tractor not too long ago. Um, you can do that in an apple picking farm. You can do it specifically for hay rides, pumpkin patches, all different places. It's just any type of fall. It's, it, they pop up all of the time in fall Yeah, around here. It's a it's, fall thing. It is a fall thing. Now, you don't normally have the hay in the hay ride as much. It's, yeah, you do. Uh, sometimes. It's not always... What kind of... What on... kind of... Garbage hay rides have you, have you sat been on? on hay? Yeah, really? hay bales, hay bales. See, I always sit in like the seats and then there's just hay on the floor. Like, no, to be adorable. That, that's not a hay ride. <laughs> that's a cart ride. See, I don't think I've done that that much. I've done it a little bit, but not as much. You must go to some shady, shady places. Look, I like, I like a good deal. So I think that might be what it is. But go, regardless. Spend the money and actually go to a hay ride. It's not particularly comfortable. The hay is sharp and pokes you it's but... like sand but more painful so like you know how sand gets into all of your crevices hay has a way of doing that yeah, but it's... it hurts while doing it yeah it's it's this weird combination of soft but also sharp and pokey yeah so do it but also be warned i guess wear two pairs of pants maybe yeah but on top of that so we've established it is generally tractors i guess most tractors have hay on it not all the ones that i've been on but regardless uh, but on top of that, Clydesdales. Now, if you are a millennial or 90s kids, you should recognize what Clydesdales are and why they are famous. It's Budweiser. It's Budweiser, it's yeah. It's Budweiser. It's Budweiser. They've, been, they've been famous for longer than just millennials. They've been famous for decades and decades. But as a millennial, they are in all of those commercials. Yeah. So th- that's something that I think probably factored into why they put them on there, just because they're so recognizable. And for the longest time, you could actually go and visit the, the actual Budweiser Clydesdales. I believe it was in Maine. I don't know if you can still do it. It's Merrimack, New Hampshire. Oh, New Hampshire. Okay, so still New so England. New England can is... Can you still do it? They are no longer re- mm-hmm. residing in Merrimack. They still have the stables that you can tour. But they don't have the actual Clydesdales they, anymore. I don't think they have so the actual sad. Clydesdales. You can do the brewery tour and all of that. I think the actual Clydesdales are now in Missouri, which is okay. kind of a cop-out. So sad. So for the longest time, you could do that, and I wanted to for so long. But yep. I think that the thing that stood out to me about this is to get Clydesdales, from what I can tell, it is quite pricey. Now, I've Googled trying to find a way that we could do that. Just, you know, fun little fall thing. We're moving into fall, and why not? You can't. It's very pricey. You can rent them out for, like, larger groups in a more affordable way, but still quite pricey. I looked it up and it's a, it's around two grand for the day to rent a class. Are you trying to say that's not pricey? No, no, that's ex- okay. That's extortion. I thought you were trying to say like actually it's only two grand. No, that's that's extortion. That's 
ridiculous price. Yeah, no. It's a horse. It's crazy. Now, I understand that horses are expensive, <laughs> but it's you're renting them for a day. Yeah, well, oh, I mean, I'm assuming most places that do something like this for a town, it would be like a week or something. But yes, yeah. if you're doing it for yourself, $2,000 for a day? No, no, no. Um, but we haven't met Taylor yet. But if, if you know the show, you know that Taylor is the one that organizes town events and, and decides what goes into town events. And I'm just so curious. Do you think he would have opted for this pricey hayride? Obviously. You do. He's extra as hell. He, <laughs> he is, is very so extra. super extra. He has the old time candy shop later on. He has an event every day in this, in this town. Like there's not a single day of the show where there's not some kind of small town event, which is somehow not bankrupting the town <laughs> because they have like a, a yarn knitting thing where he spends thousands of dollars to raise thousands of dollars. <laughs> it, no, he, he absolutely goes for exactly how it has to be done in a very specific way. See, I picture Penny Pitching Taylor. You, you see him in a lot of scenes where he's like always talking about how much things cost and like trying to make sure things look nice and doing the best for the town. And I think to yeah. myself, he would pick the tractor. Like he would do a hayride for sure, but he would pick a tractor. No, he's going out of his way to have the horse-drawn carriage because... The, how the town looks is more important to him than the cost of it. Mm, that's and fair. I think I think there's the two conflicting things, and then the town pride always wins for Taylor. So is always. one of Kirk's jobs like the poop scooper? Because someone's got to do it. Oh, it's definitely Kirk's job. Right? Okay. It's, I figured. It, I, Kirk is the one person that works in that town consistently. <laughs> so yeah. And someone has to do it because Taylor would not allow the, no, the horse poop all over the town. No, Absolutely not. That would be... See, we are lucky we didn't see Kirk just following along behind the carriage, <laughs> picking things up as he goes. Like that, that was the deleted scene that we all yeah. all missed out. We on. all needed to see. We were cheated of Kirk cleaning horse poop in the in the pilot. That would have been an amazing job of Kirk's. Like I just feel that is perfect. And it would have set the tone for he does all of the jobs in town. He does everything with pride. Yeah. Like just he's wonderful. So he's okay. not in the pilot at all, but that would have been a, a perfect way to do it. Yes, that that would have been his moment. But I just wanted to see what you thought there. Okay, so now we are moving into Rory Meets Dean. And this is probably the most famous scene of the pilot, I think. It's the one that I can quote. It's the one I've seen the most. It's the one I've seen clips of the most. Yep. It is where Rory meets Dean and she quotes Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, it's her last day of school, isn't it? Like, it's her last day before she leaves. Yeah, she's like collecting her stuff. Yep. Um, and he asks her if um, she's moving. And she said, no, just my books are. Yeah. I believe is the words she used. And so... Personally, we need to mention that we actually did a whole movie podcast episode on this. We did a whole podcast about movies in the past so that we could watch this movie yeah, no. because of Gilmore Girls. No. You can't. I'm not going to accept that that was not a, an elaborate long con setup for you to watch Rosemary's Baby and then all of the other movies that were related to Gilmore Girls. I mean, that would have been amazing and I would have been really proud of myself for that kind of dedication, but... No. So if you, by any chance, happen to find us through the movie podcast, I doubt you did, but you never know. There's like four did. of you that had watched the movie podcast. And, and if you did, we love you. Um, But we did do a whole episode. I think we still have that somewhere, like in a vault of some sort that we could always share. We definitely mentioned Gilmore Girls. For sure. There's no way I covered that movie without bringing it up. That's impossible. I, I think I had a segment on the movie podcast about... How every movie relates to Gilmore Girls. I'm pretty sure. Like, I had a whole segment. Yeah. So, there, it's impossible. Yeah. I did not not mention it. But, so we did see the entire movie. And we, I mean, what did you think of the movie? I mean, it's a classic. I mean, there are some rather questionable scenes where Satan comes to Earth and has his way with a, a character. Like, it's, it's, there's a lot. And in that movie. And then that's how Rosemary's Baby is created, correct? Correct, no. yeah. yeah. I, the, it's been a while, but yeah. It's the whole idea of a satanic worshipping gr group of old people are making this poor woman have the devil's baby. Yes. And this movie, I believe, came out in 1978? 68. 68, okay. So it's, it's a quite an older movie, but it's pretty well-renowned. 
So I think this reference is setting her up as being very quick-witted, kind of like really in the know with like some of these obscure references. It's a, the eclectic. It, she has her mother's kind of sense of humor because that's the person that she spends all of her time with is her mother. She's just a, a younger Lorelai Laura yes. Gilmore. Yeah. So I want to mention what Tannis Root is because I know when I first watched this show, there's not a chance I knew what it was. I'm pretty sure I re-listened to it so many times thinking, well... They must be talking about a real thing. So, like, I must no. know these words. So, if you don't know Tannis Root, don't feel bad. It is made up. It is a fictional herb that is distributed by a cult. So, I think the reason that she says this here, she says, you look like Ruth Gordon with a Tannis Root. I think the reason she says that is because Dean is literally hovering over her. Yeah, it, and is very creepy and giving her, like, that very uncomfortable vibe. Like, somebody is waiting to hand you, like, you know, one of those pamphlets. It's, she's sitting there trying to give her the necklace with the Tannis root right. in it. And she's just like, take it. Take it. For the love of God, take this. Right. And that's yeah. kind of how he seems. He's, like, in, in her space. And he's kind of just, like, very creepy. So I think she's really yeah. referencing that. But I want to ask quickly... Dean knew what she was talking about. And if you know how this show progresses, one of the biggest complaints that people have that are anti-Dean or not Team Dean, which I am not Team Dean, if anyone was wondering, um, is that Dean doesn't share her interests like other boyfriends do down the road. And in this scene, he does. He he shows that he does have the same obscure interests that she it's does. movie versus reading but, I it's, mean, we don't have to all, like, exactly the same things. We just have to have interest. And well, that's that's just a case, that's just a point in the case for Dean not, not being as bad as he is. So you're, you're making a case for Dean. No, you realize what you're doing. I think it progresses that he starts losing that. It's almost like, like in Boy Meets World, when Eric becomes dumber, I think that Dean becomes less like Rory as the show goes on. I, I think that's fair because he, he seems more keyed into her as a person because he, he's watching her I have not, opinions. in a creepy way but like it's he he's aware of Moby Dick and her uh, Melville and Madame Bovary and all of the references well, that he's we're able make. to keep up yeah yeah and that, that's not the, the that, later in the that's not the scene. Dean that we get later on no. so I think that they've done him a disservice from the pilot to later on okay I just wanted to see how you felt about that now, Rosemary's Baby is probably one of the most referenced things in Gilmore Girls. It's, it's referenced quite a lot. Mm. It's referenced like three or four times. Within the show, you mean? In the show, yeah. Do you think there's a reason for that? I, I have no idea. It's, I mean, it's just a reference to make, I guess. And it, I mean, it was super popular. And I also think that the idea of being part of a cult is kind of something that they make fun of quite a bit in the show. It just must be something that maybe Amy Sherman found funny. Which is super or... ironic given the cult-like nature of the fans of this show. I, th I guess that's fair. That's fair. I actually have a reel that I will have already posted by the time this comes out that has to do with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you make me watch it all of the time, so... I don't know what you're talking about. No, it's, it's making fun of cults, but this is a cult classic show. It's kind of, it's... It's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a religion, as yeah, they say. Exactly. <laughs> but I do want to, before we move past this scene, and you've mentioned it already, he was watching her. His words, not mine. And I'm just curious, how do we feel about that? Because it has creepy vibes. Yeah, he only gets away with it because he's Jared Padalecki. I mean, if, he's gorgeous. Is that what we're trying to say? Because he's, yeah. yeah he's, it's, pr it's pretty privileged. It's 100% things that att only attractive people can do. But I guess I'm just trying to think, like, if I was a, t a high school girl, or just a girl in general, I guess I don't need to be in high school, would I find it endearing that a guy has been watching me to the point where he knows what I've been reading, but he's never approached me to speak to me. He's literally been, like, peeping toming me. Would, would that be attractive? I feel like that would be a turnoff. Like, I'd be weirded out. I think it depends on the person. I mean... Even... It, I, you think that attractiveness overcomes creepiness? I, I absolutely do. I, that, I, that, that's I something would, wrong with that. That should not be. I agree <laughs> that it's a flaw in the system. I mean, there's a reason that Patrick Bateman gets all the women up to the his, his penthouse to murder them. It's because he's Christian Bale. Like... <laughs> And he's loaded and rich. Like, it's just, that is undeniably true. So you think that he, she finds it endearing because she finds him attractive? Correct. 
I and guess, I, I will stand by that and argue that point to no end. I, I mean, I guess I can see where you're coming from there. I just feel like that would not be endearing to me. I would be like, why were you just watching me? If it was a different, less attractive... If it was Minkus from Boy Meets World, it would totally different vibe. You, you'd file a restraining order immediately. Exactly. Like, that's Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Or... Or just the, the unattractive, creepy kid that smells bad in class. Like, that's... You're you're not having the same reaction. You're just not. But there's an entire show nowadays about this. You know what show I'm talking about. My most famous meme ever. You. Where this guy is a relatively attractive guy. And he's literally That just reinforces people. the point. Because he gets away know. with it. They don't know. But my point is, though... We as a society have determined that that is creepy, but we let it go in this context. And I'm just, I don't know. I we let it go because of pretty pretty privilege. I guess. I, I, I don't know how I feel about it, but that's fine. We're moving into Melville. There's a lot of heavy, heavy book references in this show. And I have a whole, whole monologue prepared. Okay. Well, I've got some funny things in here, too, but let's just give it a quick overview. So, uh, Dean is kind of talking about the books that he's seen her read and, you know, or whatever, seen her. It's fine. Um, so, Moby Dick is one of the ones he mentioned. She says it's her first, Melville. And just so you know what this book is about, in case you haven't read it, it is about the obsessive quest of a sea captain for revenge against a great white whale named Moby Dick. Yeah, it, who doesn't who doesn't know the premise of Moby Dick? I, I mean, I don't know. I just want to make sure that we're giving everyone context. It, I did have something I wanted to talk about. Is this book is about obsession and following that obsession past the point of sanity? Yes. Is that related to who Rory is in the pilot, where she's following her obsession of Harvard to no to no end? She wants to go to Chilton. To further that, she wants to do all of these things in this singular pursuit of her idea. It's not even Harvard. It's her idea of Harvard. And, I mean, in overall, her mother's idea of Harvard. Yep. It's, I mean, we see later in the show that she has all these pennants all over her wall. She, you know, has been idolizing Harvard for as long as she can walk. It, it is definitely obsessive. And I, and I even wrote down on obsessive nature. I, I definitely think that is a reference. I also think it also comes back to Dean and his obsessive nature to do with Rory. Not even in this, but as we see, as they go through their relationship, one of the critiques of Dean is not only obsessive, but uh, but possessive. So I, I do think it's, it's both. It, it's really speaking yeah. to who both of these characters are about to be in the show, in my opinion. So you think it was chosen specifically because of that? I... I would love to believe that. I don't know if that much foreshadowing yeah, went into it. We're but running into the trap of assigning meaning retroactively that maybe the the show writers had no intention of of no, implying. But I do think that at minimum they were trying to show the obsessive nature of Rory because that's already being set up. I do think that that is for sure there. Um, one other thing that I think is a theme in the pilot is all of the books that they reference, minus I think Madame Bovary, but all of the others are about American journeys. And this is kind of their, it's kind of talking about their journey from Hartford to like where they are now. They are in New England, which all of them are kind of around the New England area. So I do think that th there's a theme there too. So I think all of the literary references, all of the author references in this are directly foreshadowing future characters or future arcs mm -hmm. or directly tied to the, the the pilot episode so madame bovary for example also mentioned recently uh, is about someone living beyond their means and bringing about their own destruction and she's living beyond her means in that she can't afford chilton and it brings about her destruction of having to go back to her parents yeah, so I definitely think all of the books in here yep. are strategically placed. I don't think that they are there just haphazardly, but I do think we are assigning a little bit more to it just with knowledge of the show. But, I mean, that's the fun of doing a podcast retroactively, right? Yes. Now, 
we can't move into Madame Bovary just yet because on my research, um, you guys will learn as we do this podcast that I love to go down weird rabbit holes and I stumbled on the website, the annotated Gilmore Girls. And if you guys don't know, they do a lot of looking at the references and kind of giving an idea of what they think it might be about or why it might be there. And for Moby Dick, they said the sexual innuendo of a big dick cannot be disregarded when we're talking about it coming from Dean. And I just found that so, like, I would have never thought to myself that having Moby Dick be a book that Dean talks about was a reference to his large... It was just a, just a dick joke rather I, than... I, I would never have thought that. But do you think that's possible? Do you think they thought that? I mean, he I is mean, very tall. I mean, it's entirely possible. I, I mean, mean, and when I think of Tannis Root now and I think of the innuendo, I think of what a root looks like and now here we are so now i don't know it feels like there's a lot of phallic symbols in there that i would not have picked up on before which comes into play later in the series when they have their serious moment when he's married and are you talking about his literal phallic symbol yeah basically <laughs> that's great lovely yeah it's there's a whole thing there's a lot of things comes flopping around full circle flopping around <laughs> really Anyway, I thought that was very funny. So I don't know if anybody else thinks that is the case, but if you see other phallic symbols in the pilot episode that we have missed, please, please do let us know. I mean, to to rein it a little bit back in it's from not there. too much because yeah. that if anyone knows what Madame Bovary is about, not well, too much. Whaling is actually very integral to the history of New England as well. It there's is. there's a lot of high schools that have the the mascot or the team name. The Whalers. We're going to high school now. It well, feels uncomfortable. It's all of the towns. Awkward. All of the towns on the coast are either the Whalers, the Sailors, or some. Yeah, it's true. I mean, all of them. Mm -hmm. So, it also plays into that they live in Connecticut. Yeah, a lot of the pilot references are are really setting it up that we're in New England, like yeah. letting you know. I mean, Moby Dick is the great American novel, and she. It's also the whole she reads like a crazy person. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other entire conversation about how she has the most pretentious reading list of all time. Yes. And we'll get to that. But I feel like we're, we're we've covered it a lot in this episode. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't do this. That's a long conversation. So next is Madame Bovary. Yeah. And, and not, same not at all less pretentious. I'm just... Not at all. But we're in the same conversation. Dean is talking about books she has read. And do you want to give an overview of what it is? Or do you want me to? It's basically a woman that lives beyond her means and cheats on her husband basically she's uh, an intellectual she's an intellectual that doesn't want to just exist in the boring everyday life and she wants to have fun adventurous times and and she gets bored with her doctor yeah. husband yeah exactly so she cheats which if anybody knows the show knows that i know that it's probably not foreshadowing but it's awfully convenient I, I still think it's more to do with the fact that Lorelai has to afford children and she's living beyond her means, sending her daughter to a private school, so she has to destroy her life and go back to her parents. Fair. However, we've got infidelity. Yeah. So this person in the book is very um, about infidelity, all about it, gets bored. So we've got, obviously, infidelity with Dean yeah. later in the, in the series, but then also in A Year in the Life... We have Rory who gets so bored with her boyfriend that she forgets his name while cheating with Logan. So I'm just saying, it. I know they probably didn't think about that. But spoilers, that dear. I have not gotten to your <laughs> life. Well done. There is going to be spoilers in this podcast. If you didn't know, you know now. But yeah, so I do think that even though they didn't intend for that, that is pretty funny to see there. That's just an interesting thing. It's, it's all kind of just interconnected in a way that a lot of shows don't reach because they're more superficial and they don't actually re resemble real life as well as Gilmore Girls. They don't they don't illustrate the human interaction and human condition the way that the show does. Yeah, and I do think that some of these references are so perfect that that is just that wouldn't happen in real life. Like it's it yeah. makes it a little bit improbable. It's a little bit on the nose. Yeah, but 
it means that the writers were very smart in thinking about what they were doing, and that makes it so fun to just kind of look at. I have a question. Oh, boy. Speaking of the pretentious one last time, does Rory only read those books, or does she read trash and trashy stuff at some time? Not trashy as in smutty, but, like, <laughs> just not classics. Like, just a easy, lighthearted read that is not particularly well written just a, a palate cleansing kind of not having to read a heavy Madame Bovary or War and Peace or yeah see I mean I feel like that's always a question when you look at Rory because a, a, a true reader somebody who really loves reading They're... will read everything they, they want to read yeah. not just the classics they want to read you know things that make them happy or things that make them sad things that make them think like they, they read the dinner menu at the restaurant for God like right. they'll read everything not just it feels sometimes when you look at the stuff she's reading, like she's reading specifically because of her obsessive nature to get into Harvard. Yeah. She wants to be able to say she's read all of these really pretentious, like well-known works of literature right. and not even wants to read them to enjoy them, but to check them off a list. Yeah. It seems, it seems a little bit performative on her reading list where she's just checking a box saying done that I can move on to the next one so that, when I have to interview with someone, I can say, oh, uh, quote Madame Bovary or, or quote War and Peace or whatever. It's just, it's... And based on like who you see her being in the show with Anne Lorelai, it seems so strange that she wouldn't like more, not trashy, but, you know, more pop culture-y, more well, that's like exa- fun yeah, it's stuff. Just... That's what they seem like, those type of people that would enjoy that stuff. It's just, it's a broader range. Maybe read some kind of fantasy novel or fiction or like a mystery. A thriller or a, or even like a love story. Like a little like, you know, teen bop romance type thing. Just a a dime store paperback of some kind. It doesn't have to be the greatest literary work of all time. It just, it has to be something that you enjoy reading. Yeah, I mean, I've gone through the list that she reads from time to time. and, And I'm a reader. I love reading. And there's no way. Like, I couldn't just do that. It's it's dense and it's overwhelming. And it. Yeah. I feel like if you only read those books, you would be turned off to reading. Like, it's just not... It's, and you'd also be horrifyingly pretentious to the point of <laughs> no one wanting to have a conversation with you because... And she's not, though. She, or at least she doesn't come off that way in, in the earlier seasons. No, she's down to earth, which is just very contrary to that reading list. Now, you said you read Moby Dick, didn't you? Yes. Do, do you think that it's realistic that she would have read this at this point in her education? I mean, I think I read it about this. I remember reading it in high school. I don't remember okay. uh, when, but I was probably 15, 16, maybe 18. Okay, so it's there. not overwhelmingly it's, hard books. I know no. some of the books she reads. Uh, I know she mentions The Fountainhead later on. I couldn't get through that book to save my life. Yeah, uh, there's so definitely... I'm just curious if this was one of them. It's definitely doable at... Uh, the high school age, so I, I don't think it's outside of the realm of real, realism there, but it's it's not a, a quick, easy read. No, I can't imagine it would be. And she says her first Melville, so he he wrote 10 books, right? Something he wrote like a lot that? of books, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it looks like, it's like one of those things, like, I need to get a Melville on the list, I need to get, you know, yep. this author and this author, yeah, it's picking it out. I, I don't know if she would read good books, like, good books. Just easy books. It's just like something that is, you want to turn your brain off and forget about things for a bit. I would love to see in 2023 what she'd be reading now. I would love to do that. Um, All right. So our last reference here is Flojo, which before this, I did not know who Flojo was and I am embarrassed. So to set the scene, Lorelai finds out that the reason that Rory does not want to go to Chilton anymore and is having cold feet is... Dean. And how does she find out? Uh, Miss Patty. Yes. This is the first time you really meet Miss Patty. And Miss Patty throws Rory under the bus because she doesn't know that she's supposed to lie. Yeah, she doesn't it's, know that it's a secret. It's a whole, you got you got to tell me what I'm supposed to lie about to cover for you. I can't, I can't be held accountable for, for ruining the story if you didn't read me in on the fact that it's... Would Miss Patty have kept the secret if she knew it was a secret? Because I feel like she would need to tell Lorelai how attractive Dean was. Like, I feel yeah. like that's something Miss Patty would need to do. Yeah, I... Th- so, 
there would be ways to say, hey, have you seen this new boy in town? Yeah, versus... Wink, wink. You you dropped him by the studio, but have you seen this new boy? He just moved here. He's he's gorgeous. Yeah. Which is a different way to go about it. And Lorelai would still probably have connected the dots, but it would have been a, a an easier way to broach the topic without throwing Rory under the bus. Yeah, that's fair. I, I don't know that I believe Patty would have kept the secret, but that's fair. But so, yeah, so Miss Patty mentions that there, you know, your boy came by and Lorelai connects the dots and she's like, boy, okay, so this is why you don't want to go to Chilton. And she says, you need, you better turn into Flojo if you want to get away from me. Yes. So Flojo, I was around this time period and I, I don't know if it's because I didn't watch the Olympics. You were born. Well, I mean, she, yeah, 1984 and 1988 was when she won. Yeah, you were not house. around in 1984. But she. But Neither she, was I. But she was iconic, apparently. Yeah. Um, kept being an icon because of brand deals and things like that, even after she left the uh, competitive space. Well, I think it's it was very strategically done. Flo jo is just easy to say, and it's easy to, to brand that because she had. Flashy outfits. She did the the one legged jumpsuit oh. tracksuit. Oh, so cool. she she cut off one side and was famous for neon colors and bright, flashy tracksuits. Now, did you know her before this? No. Okay, so I'm, it sounded gonna, like you had some inside. I, I have no. I'm I'm literally only two years older than you, <laughs> and I was two when she won her her gold medal. Yeah. 1984 and 1988, she won the gold medal, and she was considered to be the fastest woman of all time. Yeah, she still holds the record for the 100 and 200 meter. That's insane. That she set in 1988. So she is still the fastest woman. Yeah, unfortunately, she died at 38 years old of an yes. epileptic seizure. Um, but Bringing it way down. I, right I know, but I do think this reference is here as a way to solidify Lorelai as a child of the 80s because it's one of the yep. older references and it really kind of shows the difference in age between Lorelai and Rory, I think. I think that's why that's there. Yeah, she was actually, I think in 2022, Time did Person of the Year and she was voted Woman of the Year in 1988. Flojo was? Yes. Wow. In, in the year that I was born. Yes, which is why that I would disagree with time, and I'd say that you're the woman of 1988. Oh, that's so cute. You need yeah. to get in there. You wrote that down? I did. Yeah, of course you did. <laughs> of course I did. Always look for opportunities to... Are you looking for husband of the year? Is that yeah. what you're, you're aiming for? I'd settle for husband of the day. <laughs> I mean, okay. Well, you got the on a recording, so now other people can vote for you, so good for in you. In posterity, I am wonderful... <laughs> and I have no flaws at all. Of course not. No. Now, before we close this out, I have one little piece that I saw in this scene that I, I need to... I just asked a quick question about. So, as we're standing here and Lorelai is yelling at Rory that she better turn into Flojo, there is a sign in the background of Miss Patty's. And it says, Gymnastics, Ice Skating, Baton Twirling, and Modeling. And modeling is spelled with two L's. And I am curious if you think this sign changes after the set is moved from Canada to America. Because from what I can tell from Google, it's spelled with two L's everywhere but America. As we know, the pilot is shot in Canada. If this is going to be something that changes as the show goes on, like are they going to change that to be the Americanized spelling later on? Or do you think they keep that just, you know, for continuity purposes? So I, I'm betting you this is a, a missed thing where they probably didn't take the time to ship the set pieces down. They just redid them. And I bet you there is a, a, dif a difference there and a kind of a continuity break. I'm, I'm curious. I'm also curious if on that sign they add dance because as we know, I mean, they even mention it in this in this episode in the pilot that she is known as the dance studio, and yet it says gymnastics, ice skating, baton twirling, and modeling. They don't say dance. Uh, my question is, where is the ice rink? <laughs> she says figure skating. Where, where is that? Maybe that's how Luke learned how to make an ice rink in the backyard when he does that for Lorelai later in the show. Maybe he's done that for Miss Patty for years, and he just knows how to do it now. <laughs> I just because that's a. 
she the, where is the ice rink? I, where is the ice rink? I I don't know. And also, it for modeling, it does like does she like bring these people out into like the city? Because you're not modeling in a small town. Like that's not no. you're not doing that. So there's just so many questions, and I'm curious if this sign is going to change over time. So now I'm gonna need to pause when we go to Miss Patty's, and I'll probably have to check. Through a few seasons, because I'm wondering if this is a sign that evolves over time, because it it just seems like it must, right? I mean, or it just doesn't change at all, and and, and it just stays like this yeah. for the whole time. I, I mean, and I would it, actually love it's that. A, it's a it's a sign that doesn't have dance on it, and she's the dance instructor. They literally call her the dance instructor in this yeah. show, and it doesn't say dance. I don't know. Yeah. I just found that interesting, and I needed to mention it before I forgot about it. So wanted to put that there. But that is everything for this part. We have one more episode on the pilot. I know. Stay with us, guys. And let us know if you are enjoying the deeper dive type um, episodes where we really kind of go into each part because I really love it. I love, like, really getting to know she loves everything. looking into the darkest rabbit hole she can find and pulling really obscure things out. I mean, please let me know if, if you at all enjoy my, my random historical ramblings i do i do so let us know i want to know how you guys are feeling about this and i want to know if there are pieces of the pilot that we have skipped over or that you feel like we should have talked more about or that you think that we got wrong i would really love to hear that so yep. you can find us on instagram same name as the podcast uh, message us and let us know what you're thinking but yeah that is everything we have and we will be back really soon with the final episode of the pilot thank you all for listening